last class we introduced uh, um, somewhat a new uh, design principle for learning algorithms. The first few classes when we started discussing learning algorithm, we introduced, uh, uh, or I guess we reviewed the, the idea of penalizing an empirical objective, uh, kind of regularization, and empirical risk minimization, so on, names for this kind of idea. Last week we somewhat, uh, uh, well, I guess it was last Monday, we introduced a somewhat different idea, which is the idea of using computation themselves, optimization as a device to obtain solutions that are um, at the same stable and statistically interesting and uh, on the other hand efficient from a numerical point of view. Uh, we introduced this idea with the uh, real marker uh, in the simplest case of least squares, and uh, uh, by introducing the following iteration. Here, the, let me just remind you, the notation here is that the matrix X is just the data matrix. So this guy is number of points times number of dimension or features. This is just the output vectors where you stack all the output uh, uh, in, uh, in one vector of size n. Okay? So the, the, the basic step we did last time was recognizing this to be the empirical error defined by least squares. Sorry, the gradient descent on the empirical error defined by least squares. Uh, first, somewhat discussing whether this would be a good idea or not. Uh, being initially puzzled by the fact that there is no apparent regularization going on. So if the linear model is simple enough, fine, but if you happen to be in, a, uh, say, a high dimensional setting where the number of points is much more than the number of dimensions, or in the case where D here is actually represent a set of features that we use rather than the initial variables, then this is somewhat puzzling at first sight because there doesn't seem to be an a, a way to actually control the complexity of the model, or in other words, the stability of the estimator. Then we somewhat argued, um, I tried to convince you that indeed uh, uh, this is actually a sensible idea. We first described just with drawings, and then uh, we took a, a slightly more quantitative step by sh recalling how, uh, by induction, this can be, this iteration can also be written as, uh, in, a, in a closed form, given by power series formed by the matrix, the data matrix itself to define a matrix, which is then applied to the data. And we somewhat try to compare this with uh, what we typically do when we do, say, read regression, the classical Tikhon of regularization, where rather than having this matrix here, one actually has this matrix. Okay. So, we try to say that this, this was basically the catch. So what was the catch? That this is a way to uh, stabilize the inversion of the matrix X transpose X. And this was another way to do just the same, to stabilize the matrix inversion. In which sense? Well, the idea was to look at this as a truncated power expansion. And we did this by basically uh, recalling that this is indeed a truncated power expansion whose, if you take the limit, you know, when you don't truncate the expansion, when you take the infinite sum, this is exactly this, sorry, this inverse here, okay? So if, in other words, if you go the other way around, if you take this matrix and you do a power expansion of this matrix, then it can exactly be written through this series of uh, power of matrices. Take here equal to infinity, you get an identity. If you take here t equal to uh, smaller than infinity, so you truncate somewhere, then you get just an approximation. So it's not true that this is equal to this, but the idea is that both these two choices provide some kind of approximation of this. Okay? So the basic idea, we actually consider also the, the expression of the actual finite sum, and the idea that we got is that in some sense, relationship that say roughly lambda goes as one over t and the other way around. So the parameter that plays a big role here is actually the, the number of iterations. The number of iterations can be interpreted as a form of, uh, as a kind of 
regularization parameter, and it goes somewhat the opposite way with respect to lambda. When I do many iteration, I'm fitting, and so this is like taking lambda small, just finding a fitting solution. Or if I take few iterations, this is like taking a like very big lambda, I'm regularizing a lot. Okay. This is kind of the, the fitting data perspective. You can also just take a numerical perspective and then say if lambda is equal to zero, it is as if I'm taking a lot of term in this expansion, whereas um, the other way around, if uh, 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 lambda is very big, uh, this is like taking very few steps in this expansion. Do, doing a very few okay. So uh, there are a couple of things in this story. So one is that this gives you a new perspective to think about. Uh, uh, it, it gives you some Expected bridge between numerics and statistics. If you want. Okay. So this story is typically a story that one look at uh, from a numerical point of view, from solving a linear system point of view, making computation stable. And then the idea is that in fact this is an entry point to actually how to design statistical estimator. Okay. So it's not like uh, a Bayesian point of view. It's not like an empirical risk minimization point of view. It's a slightly different point of view. I use Uh, algorithm, okay? And I say, okay, I'm just going to minimize an empirical objective, but then I'm going to use the iteration itself as a way to control model complexity or stability or however you want to call it. Okay? So this is the basically was the main take-home message the other time. This is not a, f a finished story. I didn't, we didn't quite prove this. We didn't actually try to give a quantitative relation. It was more qualitative. And this uh, can all be made very precise. And uh, essentially, one can show that these two ways of solving the problem have this exactly the same, or essentially the same statistical properties. And they're both uh, as good as possible for their class of models. Okay. So this is, I'm just, a, you know, we want to just ponder a second because this is really a, a new idea. Okay, it's an idea uh, that is somewhat different from the way typically uh, one thinks about designing uh, algorithms. And it's idea that have become quite popular in the last few years when you have to deal with large data sets because in some sense this algorithm is intrinsically computational. This is a, uh, this, this, this is a learning algorithm in a rightful sense, but it's actually a problem in a numerical sense. You have to actually invert this matrix. This is an algorithm in any possible sense you want. If you're an optimization person, this is an algorithm. If you're a statistician, this is also an algorithm in view of this connection. So the nice thing is that somewhat statistical complexity and numerical complexity somewhat meet in this, uh, this way of thinking about designing algorithms. Okay? Again, the, the, there is no real uh, statistical advantage in consider one or the other, but it is actually a computational Remember here the idea is that if you count computation, here you will have to solve this linear system. You have to try to invert this matrix uh, as many times as the number of lambdas you want to try. Whereas here, in view of the connection between lambda and t, every time you take a step, you're actually changing the regularization level. Okay? So far so good? Any questions about this stuff? That still at the high level, another thing you, you know, it, I take on message is when you optimize, you have to ask yourself if you're not regularizing already. So sometimes what you do is that you just say, okay, I, I have all my idea about how to model things and how to derive algorithm, and I'm going to write a, a minimization problem. Okay, and that's you know that's what I think is building my model. And then maybe below somewhere you stop earlier than you thought and you're basically not exploiting the model. You're already hiding some form of regularization somewhere. Okay. So because optimization regularizes, you have to worry about, or you have to be aware of the fact that when you split in your head the modeling and the computational step, you might actually be doing something you don't want to. Okay. So that's a kind of a useful practical information. You can either try to exploit it or at least defend yourself against it, okay? if you don't want to exploit it. All right, so uh, this is one comment. Uh, Name-wise, this general idea is uh, um, what is called uh, uh, you know, a, a more hacky name is early stopping, where the emphasis is on this idea that you don't have to go all the way down to convergence of this empirical. Uh, perhaps a more correct term is it, that, that is the one that I like to use is uh, iterative regularization. Okay. 
that somewhat suggests the idea that is not, the emphasis is not only on the fact that you have to stop earlier, but on the fact that every step you're taking, you're actually discovering a little bit more of the model complexity you have. Okay? You are exploring a bit more of the space of solution that you're doing in a kind of a controlled way. Um, I notice that it might be the case that, as it happens here, that lambda is to be very small. Here, you might have to take a lot of steps. So you, it's not necessarily the point that you have to go all the way down. You have to stop earlier. The point is that's the way you, you explore your solution. That's what this story is saying. We, we, we made the, uh, so this was the basic story of last time, OK? We, we made already a few add to this story, and we want to add a few more. Thing was um, some remarks. The first one was about acceleration. When you do gradient, again, this is the simplest example to explain things. We are just doing gradient descent. But now that we know that there is a bridge between optimization and statistics, we can ask, okay, can we get more out of the work that people have been doing optimization? And one possible direction is consider faster algorithms. Faster algorithm, conjugate gradient, higher order methods, uh, accelerated methods of all kinds. These are all potential choices. But then there is, again, a bit of a potential puzzle at the beginning, which is why would you want to accelerate? Your goal is, anyway, not to minimize the error on the data. So why would you want to accelerate? And to explain this, it was useful to, again, remember what is the basic idea here, which is if you look at the error on the data of your estimator, has to go down, OK? If, if things are made so that this thing converge, I'm going to see that it will go down. If my model class is, if my linear model is rich enough for my um, data, it might go to 0. Otherwise, it just will reach some asymptote, which is the best error allowed by my linear model and my data. OK, but this is the empirical error. What, is, what about the expected error? Well, again, following this analogy, what should happen is that it goes down for a while, and then it goes up. The idea is essentially at the beginning, I'm fitting the data and uh, with a model which is not simple enough. You know, I, I don't let my solution go around enough. Then I get close to the right solution, and then boom, I just start to fit the data too much. Okay? Again, if overfitting does occur, there are situations where overfitting is not the problem. You just have a situation where, for example, data are simple enough. And so after reaching a certain text, it flattens out. Okay? That can happen too. But if overfitting indeed occurs, then you will see an effect like that. Again, the flattening out can happen either because you don't have enough budget in terms of computation, or because for some reason your problem is simple enough, uh, either because your model is too simple or your data are not so complicated. Maybe the, low, the noise is low, the class are ni nicely separable, and then you don't really see this bump all the way up. Okay. I'm, I'm saying this a couple of times because uh, uh, I guess Tom is going to comment it later on. This idea of some potential puzzle in this picture when you're doing over parameterization of your model is something that you know attracted a certain amount of attention, especially specifically motivated by uh, neural network uh, architecture. And here, you know, I'm kind of poking this uh, this uh, literature in the last few months a little bit. So the take-home message of that literature is: Oh, look! If I take a very rich model, then everything is strange because I don't see overfitting. What's um, you know, this is kind of the one potential explanation. Even if your dimension is very high or you take a lot of features, if you use something like gradient descent to solve your problem, this is what's going on under the hood. Okay? And so if, if your model is really complicated, you may actually see overfitting. But if you have a budget on computation or your model is actually, your problem is not too complicated, again, the noise is not too high, or the, uh, if you have a classification problem which is separable, you're not going to see this. You're just going to see that. Essentially, this guy controls the complexity of your solution. This gradient instead controls the complexity of your solution. It doesn't really care if you're doing gazillion of dimensions or not, because it's just doing what it has to do. It just regularizes. And so what he does is that he drives the solution down until he can. And then fitting, we'll see it. And if you know, there is no overfit in the problem, it will just flatten out. But this is the same thing that you would expect if instead of t here, you were to plot 1 over lambda, and here the empirical risk and expected risk of this solution. Okay? So we don't need to invent anything new, at least here. We can just go back and, uh, and match what we already know okay, about the bias variance trade-off. You over-parameterize. 
you regularize, and then you just check uh, whether you have overfitting or not. And here, the only novelty here is you're not penalizing explicitly, but you're doing the iteration. You let the iteration do the job. And this is sometimes what is called another name that we give is implicit regularization. Okay. Um, I don't love this thing because it looks like there is some secret going on. But the idea is that this is in contrast to, say, putting a constraint on a pe or a penalty. Okay. This regularization generally refers to things that are way too regularized that are not putting a penalty or a constraint, which is the classical one. Okay. All right. So now that we have this picture in mind, we can uh, go back to what we were saying about acceleration. Why would you want to accelerate? acceleration will be basically driving the empirical error down faster. And then why would you care? Well, because what you can see is that actually you can actually drive this down faster, not lower. You don't drive the expected error lower. Why would it be the case? This, this uh, in fact, can be shown to be a good algorithm, one, but you can actually drive it down faster. Okay, which means that if you have overfitting, you can stop earlier. And if you don't have overfitting, you see it going down faster. Okay, so in some sense, if you train faster, okay, you drive the error down faster, or you stop earlier if you actually have overfitting. <laughs> That's basically what's going on, and this is pretty clear um, by now. All right, so far so good in terms of bridging the gap between optimization and statistics and trying to get uh, an idea of how optimization can help in the context where your goal is not optimizing just this empirical error, error on future data. Okay? Any questions? This pretty cool. Have you ever seen this before? Whether your curve is going to look like this or going to look like that? Yeah, like it's going to be a parabolic curve or is it going to just one? If you want, you want to know a priori, you look at yeah. the data and the algorithm. No. So what he's asking is, I told you that the curve can look, you say, like. You know, a, a learning curve can look, the, the empirical error is going to go down. And then you have that the expected error can look like this or maybe like this. Okay? Where this point can happen when the error is not zero or after the error is zero. Can you predict a priori? No, because basically, why, when would you have these different behaviors? Well, I can tell you a few that I know to get them. Typically, if your problem is hard, you really see something like this. And hardness here means that you don't have a lot of data and you have a lot of noise, either in a classification sense or in a regression sense. If you have not so few data and if your noise is not so crazy, typically this curve is what you do in drawing in class. But if you actually look at any curve you see on data, it doesn't quite look like this. It typically looks more like this. So in some sense, and taking too simple model really kills you, but taking too complicated models after time doesn't kill you. You, know, you. you do see overfitting, but it's not a super duper dramatic effect. It takes a while to, to kick in, especially because sometimes we have models whose complexity doesn't grow like crazy. You may, even when we take, say, a lot of features, there is a lot of correlation among the features and something like that. This is a purely you know, empirical statement, okay? First of all, this is the drawing that you do in class. Oftentimes on real data you see something like this because the data are not so complicated and the model is actually not that complicated either despite the fact that we try to put a lot of extra parameters. And then, you know, sometimes the, again when, uh, when things are simple you, you have that situation. Again, again if, if the noise is low, if the data are many, if your model is <coughs> classic rich enough, if your data are separable, but there is no way to know it. The point I'm trying to make here is just that uh, there's nothing magical or unexpected about this. This is what you okay? and this is what you've seen for like 20 years whenever you use any model with more parameters than, than, uh, than data. Okay? And for example, if you use kernel, this would be all the time. Another one? 
Okay, good enough. Uh, what do we want to say more? One thing I'm not going to discuss at all, but it's actually kind of cute, so I just want to mention it in passing, is the idea that you see, here I kill the step size. I just took it as a constant. I make this thing to converge, and then who's doing the job of controlling the stability of overfitting or whatever you want to call it is the number of iterations. Something that I usually get uh, as a question is, uh, can I use it as a regularizer? Can I use the step size as a regularizer? And the answer is yes. And use it. Okay, it's actually not too bad of an exercise to 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 show it in this case. Um, and I'm mentioning this because it's also that's also another big business in optimization, right? How do you choose the step size? And again, what you have in mind typically is I want to minimize this error and I want to do it quickly. And here you just want to know, oh, how can this parameterize this? of my solution. And roughly speaking, what you see is that a quantity like this, suppose for a minute that we allow the step size to possibly depend on the dimension, on the iteration. Okay? So instead of 1 over L, we take T to the minus a power. Okay? Something like constant T to the minus alpha, where alpha is a parameter that I have to choose the size. Okay? Then typically what you see is that, uh, what you see, what you can prove is that, you know, this is the right quantity in a way. Number of steps you take is really what capture how much you regularize or fit your data. This is the suppose that you take a constant step size, then this would be gamma t, okay, and that's roughly one over lambda. It's intuitive, okay. So what I'm saying is that here I show you this thing here, so that if you want to like, write it the other way around, that one over lambda was roughly t. I'm telling you a slightly enhanced story. Uh, I'm skipping. I'm not proving it in any way, but I'm telling you you can actually do a slightly. You, you can. We can keep this guy around a bit more. And then you will see that the number, total number of steps, the number of, the amount of distance you make in this sense is what really plays the role of regularization parameter. So what we did here is that we took a fixed step size to be a constant, and then we let the number of iteration do the job. You can actually do the way around. You can fix a, a fixed horizon in a number of iteration. And then let's try the regularization parameter to be the step size. Both cases, what you see is that, uh, and of course you can do both. You can do both parameter, and and that's typically what is often done in practice in large scale scenario. You first tune a little bit the step size, and then in such a way that you can still fit. And then if uh, uh, if there is some extra model complexity to control, you do early stopping. Okay, so you, you try to get this uh, aggressive enough step size so that you're not over parameter over regularizing, and then you let the number of iteration control complexity if it's needed. Okay? So typically, the you, in, I think in a lot of applications, one, uh, again, this is typically what, uh, again, is done, uh, like, it's more like, you know, things are, I mean, this is one way to interpret what's going on there when people tune uh, both parameters. Okay? Okay, so this, uh, this, is a, this is actually an acute exercise, and there are now papers about this. And, uh, and uh, it's kind of a no, again, it's another way, okay? Uh, regularizing by controlling the number of steps you make, uh, or how long the steps are in an optimization algorithm. Okay? That makes sense? I'm not proving this in any way, but I'm just putting out there as a statement, and it's kind of not incredible to, to believe it. Again, this is kind of a relatively new observation. Okay, so one thing that uh, I'm not going to discuss much is that you can go beyond least squares. You don't need to consider the square loss. This story will not work anymore. You know, this is specific to the square loss, but you can still do this and replace this with the gradient or a subgradient, for example. Uh, the proof will be, you know, the proof that this is a good idea will be different. Okay, but everything works uh, just the same, and you can use it, and you have all the other thing about acceleration, step size, and so on and so forth. Uh, okay. Yes. Yes. So what? We, the, again, one 
Well, the last thing I said, okay, you can generalize to other loss function. One thing you can ask, okay, how about other regularizer? Because somewhat hidden here in this equation, there is both the square loss and the square norm as a regularizer. You can actually generalize to other norms. We're going to discuss that a bit maybe later on. Then the computation are slightly different. You have, uh, you know, you have some sense here. You can see what happens if you consider a different loss function rather than this gradient. You're going to have another gradient or another subgradient. If you use different norms, it becomes the, the, the algorithm looks a little bit different. Okay, but you can do this. Yeah. Yeah, so what he's asking is, if I change optimization, should I expect the expected error to go up and down or just to move left and right? Okay. If it goes up and down, it means that the way I optimize matters uh, for how well you generalize. Whereas if, uh, if that's not the case, it, will only mean it, won't, it won't be, you don't generalize better, you just generalize faster. Okay, you get there faster. And I think that the truth is the second thing we said. You and prove that non-optimization algorithm is going to provide better result, provably, okay? It's a fact. You can prove it. The answer changes if you actually, again, if you, if you make me stand here and cover this part of the board. Suppose that I tell you that for some reason I have a big data set and I have a budget, okay? And I actually, am ne I'm never able to go and see I don't, I, or anyway, you are in any of the situations we mentioned where you don't, you don't have overfitting, okay? Either because you don't have the time to get there or because it's not in the data. Then we can ask the question again. And what is the answer? Well, you know, the point is that I'm basically in the constant attempt to try to drive the error down faster, okay? So in that sense, if I'm in an easy regime, if I drive the error down faster, faster means also that I'm only, then I'm gonna see a point in this curve which is lower. Again, I'm just saying literally to do this, OK? You're, if you're in this regime, which, which, which one you want? You, you, you're going to buy the dashed one or the solid one? Well, the dashed one, because look, it's lower. It's lower. Because it has, it's going faster and it's more time to run down, you know, to try to go down, OK? So in that sense, you know, morally and theor theoretically and morally, the answer is no, OK? Then, in practice, for specific cases, for special cases, or under budget constraints, the answer could be yes. So you want to know if the function that I get, say, here, it's, I call this old guy, w, in some sense, it's a T that, and then I'm going to have some WT. And you want to know if the WT that comes from gradient descent or accelerating gradient is the same or different. Yes, you are. So what he's asking is, OK, there is a difference here. But you, know, you can look at the W itself. It's a vector. You can look at the W and measure the empirical error. Or you can look at the W and look at the expected error. These are all legitimate things. And here, I'm just emphasizing either the empirical or expected error. And I would say, I would argue that for learning, that's what you care about, OK? From a mathematical point of view, typically, you look at this. Here, I'm making no that uh, um, the, uh, this two has to be exactly the same. Indeed, it can be shown for least squares that they all go in the same place. And I can show you in a minute, which is the minimal norm solution among all the ones that fit the data. So in, incidentally, the answer is yes. They all go in the same place. Uh, but if you stop along any iteration, B, you know, the same function, even if they have the same error. What he's asking now is, OK, let's assume, for a second, let's assume that there is a minimum so that you have a really a, a over, over smoothing, over fitting, so that we can talk about uh, the minimum point. Uh, how come that no matter how you solve the problem, it doesn't go up and down? Well, because to some extent, the lowest error you can make is not the property of the algorithm, it's the property of the problem. 
Okay? All these algorithms, and we're going to discuss this in a minute, work for certain class of problems and not for something else. And then, from a statistical point of view, you can ask, what is the best possible algorithm for this class of problems? And this is not the property of what I'm using, it's a property of the problem itself, of the data itself. If you give me a lot of data, I cannot go below this. Okay? That, that's the basic idea. There is some uh, information theoretic lower bounds. And no matter how you do it, you cannot do better than what's allowed by the data. So that's what's going on there. No, this is really, I, I'll show you in a minute. It's uh, because it's really about the value of the, it's really about the form of the problem. I mean, I don't think convexity enters much in this story. He's asking if there is any reason not to accelerate, not to use fast algorithm. I would say, no. Again, from a theoretical point of view, um, you, there is an absolutely no reason. It's always an advantage. From a practical point of view, I've never seen it causing any problem. You could worry about the fact that something can happen between the first two steps. Okay, And so worry about the fact that because you discretize regularization, this might harm you somehow. But that's never the case in practice because it can, you can accelerate and yet slowing it down enough that that never happens, You know that nothing happens. Curve typically looks like this, right? So there are the few first iterations where stuff happens really fast, and then things go slower. So no, you say no. Accelerate never really works. Yes. Yeah, so he's asked, so let me so let me broaden the question slightly which is uh, um, so this guy is uh, wt and this guy is w lambda how they com uh, how they compare how the set of solution generated by data and different values of lambda t compare is the minimum so we discussed already that if you get the best possible if you choose lambda or t in order to get the best possible error is the same a question you can ask is, okay, but is the set of, if I, if, suppose if this is the space of solution, and this is this best guy I can get, okay? So there is a T star, which is the best uh, stopping time. There is a lambda star, which is the best uh, uh, parameter. And these two guys, you know, give me the same error. I don't know how we choose that point, but there is cross-validation, there is an oracle, whatever. There is a way to choose the right... These two guys have the same stuff. Now what you can ask is, okay, but the way I actually explore, so this is the space of all possible solution and the corresponding error. You can ask if the, the way you explore this space is completely equivalent between these two. And the answer is in general, no. They're very similar, they're close, but they're not strictly picking equivalent. This is what we call the Lacanda regularization path. You know, if you, if you see the trajectory spanned by all the lambdas and the one by all the t, uh, this is what you call the regularization path. And they, they did not coincide. Uh, but you know that when they get to the same error, they will have the same phase. Okay? It's a bit going back a bit before. It's not the same w necessarily, but at least at the end, when you stop in the right place, they give you up to constant the same error. Nice. All right, so let's see. I want to make two observations. One is uh, um, we were left uh, to do the representer theorem. We're going to take a lazy route here, which is remember how we did it? How did we prove the representer theorem for this guy? We did the trick. What was the trick? You remember? said, OK, proving the representative theorem in this context just amount to showing that uh, the W is uh, of a specific form. You can rewrite the representative theorem in a somewhat easier algebraic way by basically saying that W can always be written how, you remember? For the linear case, we can just say that W is actually a X at the transpose C, which means that my W is not any W, it's actually a linear 
combination of the training set points. So these are numbers and these are the training set points. Okay? This is the same as saying that my function is a linear combination of the kernels when you go to feature maps and blah, blah. How did we prove it? We proved this for this guy. How? You remember? It was a linear algebra trick. Right, so what we did to do what? Well, to take this matrix, move it on the other side, and swap in the order. Well, guess what? You can do the same thing here. You can change this matrix here, which, by the way, is an excellent code. You have to go and move it in front, and then you will have to swap the order of this. So you get excellent code. Um, there is a gamma, and then there is identity minus x set, x set transpose, j equal from 0 to 2 minus 1, y. Okay? It's, it's, the same as, it's the same as the other one, okay? You will have to plug in the SBD in this expression rather than the other one. Okay, but then what you see is that, okay, you see this is going to be your C. And the C, here we started from this iteration, we got here. Now we got another expression like this. You can go back to an iteration of this form. Okay. And the iteration you get is going to look like this. It's going to be that Wt is always of the form x transpose ct, where ct plus 1 is equal to ct minus gamma, x set transpose, x set, x set transpose ct minus y. Okay. Then to go here to there, we went by induction. We can do that way or another. We're here. We can unroll it back into an iteration. And this is the iteration you get. The key point here is that this matrix is now n by n. Okay. So it's, uh, we use exactly the same kind of reasoning we used uh, in the, the early story. Yes. Like transpose normal transpose transpose normal transpose. Okay. Anyway, I'm spending a little time on this because there's nothing deep happening. Okay, it's the same trick you've used a bunch of time yet another time. So if you hated the trick, I don't want you to bang your head again. If you see it, it's just the same stuff again and again. And what you can appreciate is that anyway, if you believe me, this is a very simple iteration, and this is what is the kernel matrix for the linear case. If you were to redo this whole reasoning in a feature space, replacing the actual data with their feature map version, this will become the kernel matrix, and everything you said can just implement them in another way. Okay? So this part is the part that where we, the, the efforts we made at the beginning somewhat pays off because we are using the same idea again and again. Okay? Um, let's make a couple of observations. about this? Is the reasoning clear? So, uh, I think, uh, again, let me just mention it quickly. That in the for the least squares, um, for least squares, these two algorithms we saw that I showed you two instances. I showed you Tikhonov, bridge regression, and the gradient descent, L2 boosting, Land Weber iteration, however you want to call it. And you see that they have both a kind of the shape of a matrix. They depend on another lambda or t. Let me just write lambda. Then applied to this x transpose x, y. They both look like this. There is a, a matrix, what in statistics I call a smoothing matrix, applied to x transpose y. And you obtain this matrix always in the same way, by basically doing something to the uh, covariance or data matrix. What do you do? For example, let's look at this. You basically do some kind of matrix operation on this matrix here. Okay. Now, if uh, you take the... Take this matrix now, and you take its eigen decomposition. It's a symmetric positive definite matrix, so it means that I can do it, and this is just going to be a diagonal matrix with uh, positive numbers on the diagonal. Let's say that they are decreasing, okay? 
Then uh, you get a cute uh, observation that somewhat connects this way of doing a uh, machine learning algorithm to classical filtering and signal processing. It also gives somewhat of an insight of where these methods are going to work or not. Okay? So if you, you see, if I take this matrix and I know of this expression, can I actually give, uh, can I describe this as an operation on the eigenvalue of the matrix? So I take this matrix, I know that I'm going to perform this operation or write down this expression. Can I write the same expression by considering the eigenvalue? The answer is yes, is what is basically the idea of spectral calculus or using the, exactly the cute thing about working on this. And basically this says that, you look, I can do this. I can go here, I can go work in the, in the, the way I want to write it is this. I can actually consider Suppose that the matrix sigma is just a diagonal matrix of sigma 1, sigma d, where the sigma 1 is the big one. OK, sigma 1 is bigger than sigma 2. Then basically doing this operation can be described as an operation on this, which is just doing the following thing. On each element of the diagonal, just consider uh, the same operation you would want the matrix, but now as a real valued function, okay? So what I mean is that this WT can now be written, um, say, if I look at the component, okay. gamma sigma, of course, thanks. So I have to take the same exact operation on the eigenvalues, okay? If, and what if you do Tikhonov? If you do Tikhonov, you're gonna, you know, the operation will be the x transpose plus lambda, blah, blah, and it would just be sigma plus lambda to the minus one, okay? Now, this is kind of cute, because now you can do the following analogy. You can think of, if, if you're familiar with process, you know, the filtering and signal processing, you have, typically you say a low-pass filter is what? You take a function, you express it in components in a frequency domain, and you, Try to keep low frequencies and kill high frequencies. That's what the low pass filter does. Do the following analogy. Consider uh, low pass, so low frequency are big eigenvalues, and uh, high frequencies are uh, small eigenvalues. What you can see is that here, basically, what you're doing is that if you see a big eigenvalue, this, either this expression or this one are, gonna, are not going to do much to it. I'm going to typically leave it as it is. But if you actually insert here a small eigenvalue, lambda, and equally you can show t, are going to kill it, okay? Are going to decrease its importance by a lot. This means that these methods are basically doing a form of filtering on the eigenvalues of your data matrix or if you want the singular value of your data matrix. So they work by basically saying, I take these small eigenvalues and I throw them away. Maybe not exactly throwing them away, maybe I just decrease their importance a bit. And they just do it in two different computational ways. They don't do it by diagonalizing your matrix. This is not a computational comment, it's just a conceptual comment. They both throw away small eigenvalues. Okay? So this is another connection because it shows that in some sense this stuff is doing some form of filtering on what? On a set of specific eigenvectors that are related to my data matrix. Do you know what is the name of this eigenvector? Suppose that you're doing a machine learning first. You take the data matrix, you build x transpose x, and then you diagonalize it. Enough. So what are we saying? We're saying that this algorithm, they basically say what? In the linear case, they say they love the first principal components and they assume that the function can be, can be written on the first few principal components. Anyway, the components corresponding to a small principal component don't matter, okay, too much. And then they try to kill them. If you go from the linear case to the non-linear case, you're going to do something a bit more complicated because it's not just PCA, PCA, but it's going to be a kernel PCA version. So it's a bit more complicated to think about. Okay, but that's kind of what's going on. So if you want to see, you see the no free lunch going on. So typically every algorithm have a class of problem for which it works and a class of problem for which it doesn't work. What is, can you build the function for which these algorithms are not going to work? How would you do it? Build me a problem for which these algorithms are going to be horrible. 
take some input points, diagonalize the matrix, and take the last eigenvector and put you know, a rescaling of the last eigenvector. Worst possible. This guy is betting that that doesn't happen, that the important information is on the first few eigenvector. Just pick the last one, and you're going to kill this guy. They can do a good job, but they have to go all the way down. So whatever noise happened before, they're going to take it all in. OK? Just an analogy, OK? When, uh, when, uh, when you have a set of bases, so what, what is a what is a, a Fourier basis? It's just a basis with an ordering. Okay, so you give a name to certain things and other things, low and high frequency. Whenever you have a basis with a set of weights, you can give you, you, you can put an ordering and then give names. Okay, you can always give names. So the names here are each eigenvector come from a weight. I order them and then I give names. Okay? That's just an analogy. I call big, slow, uh, big, low, and small, high. That's all. And it's just the same experience. So we learned two things, as I promised, hopefully. One is that you can now think about this as a form of filtering. And you also get a feeling on when these algorithms are going to work or not. Where, in some sense, hidden in the shadow, some form of PCA method from your problem. One thing that we're not going to discuss, but you could do, is to say, OK, but can you generalize this reasoning? Because look, this, if I go in this kind of, if I now put, uh, you know, as that this guy, the big and small eigenvalue, I could actually draw these functions. These are just one dimensional functions that act on the eigenvalue. You could draw them, and they would have to look something like this. You would have to say, OK, small eigenvalues, I roughly let them be, but the big eigenvalues, I let them be, but small eigenvalues, I kill. And you basically could ask questions such as, OK, what is the exact difference between two functions? Well, there will be two real valued functions that roughly have the same shape, but not exactly the same. One thing you can ask, okay, are there other ways of and are they interesting? Can you think of one that you can kind of immediately guess what to do next? Again, I give you two ways of filtering. I'm asking you if you can see of another one. I take the eigenvalues and I have to preserve the big one and not preserve the small one. These are fairly fancy way of doing this, right? They're big, let them be. If they're small, kill them. Right. Why not? Well, it's, is it a learning algorithm? Yes. It's what is called TSVD. Again, it will be this. What is called TSVD. It's basically based on uh, truncated single value decomposition, or truncated eigenvalue decomposition. It's basically equivalent to take the data, do PCA, and then just run PCA. So if you do PCA, Your input data, and then you just do least squares on the projected data. You don't regularize, you don't do anything else. So you do, say, empirical risk minimization. That's equivalent. Okay, these two things are equivalent, are just one specific filter. That's what you do. Okay, and this is what you call sometimes PCR, principal component regression. Just another algorithm from this point of view. And this shows you that you, in some sense, you have various coordinates in which you can uh, generalize algorithms. Okay, we start from that. We get an idea, and uh, then so we, we start from Tikhonov. Then we move in the direction of iterative regularization. Then we can say, what about other loss function? What about other norm? And here we're taking yet another point of view, which what about this filtering idea? Can we use it? And this is just a small pointer, OK? Uh, it's a quick one. There is a lot of stuff going on. But this is just to show you, yes, you can go there. And for example, you recover principal component regression, or PCA, or TSVD, or whatever you want to call it, it's yet another way of doing things. And you can basically see that these are all very much related. So uh, in these past two classes, we, we expanded greatly the way of uh, designing learning algorithms, okay? through iteration and through projection. And notice again that here, this idea is one question you can ask, okay, PCA is one way to do dimensionality reduction. Can I replace here with some dimensionality reduction plus ERM? Well, you ask me if I know many proofs that you can do this. No, if it's true in practice, yes. Okay? And this tells you also, beware, because if you write a regularization algorithm by Tikhon, by penalization, and then you optimize, and maybe before you do a little bit of preprocessing by doing a projection, you may actually be regularizing three times. Once because you design it, once because you do dimensional reduction, and once because you're optimizing. Again, this might be what you want to do, but sometimes no, so you have to know. OK? So this is how you. OK. Right? Any question about this? This is 
again, is, is, a, is, a, is a small pointer to a long, long story, OK? OK, so we've done a lot of stuff already. So let's do a recap of what we are, and then let's add some more stuff. So we did the iterative regularization, discussing acceleration, step size, regularization. We did the representer theorem. Now we hinted at spectral filtering. So we added somewhat quickly TSVD slash principal component regression to our list of algorithms. Okay. So what we want to try to do now is to uh, to spend uh, half an hour or so to, um, to look at one um, somewhat slightly different regime. So this is what I would call uh, what you do. Fine, because usually I do write something weird, but if you tell me, I can fix it. OK, so uh, in all the situation we've been considering so far, we've been considering a different way to control the complexity. Well, not uh, the same kind of complexity for now, L2, but different way of enforcing this with different uh, uh, designing principle. Penalization, optimization, projection, filtering, all these different point of views. In all this situation, we actually consider the case where our algorithm takes the data and processes them at once. Okay? So one thing you can ask is, uh, you're in a situation where you learn one point at a time. What do I mean by this? What do I mean by point? I mean, you know, usually you have y1. But this indexing, it doesn't, doesn't have any implication in terms of the ordering of the data. All our algorithms are somewhat symmetric with respect to a reshuffling of the data. What if your data come, uh, really have an order, OK? Or what, if, what if your algorithm want to process them one after the other? Can, you might be this is roughly what is often called online learning. Term is used in more or less precise fashion depending on the context, but that's roughly the idea. You get one point, you process it, and then you do something else. Why would you want to do this? Why would it be a good idea to do this? Or why you might think about doing this? So one is numeric constraint. Typically what people mean is that you know if you have a large scale problem. If you have a large scale problem and use this algorithm. What do you do? You take a point, a piece of the gradient. Then another point comes. You compute another piece of the gradient, you see? And then once you compute the gradient, you finally update your solution. Okay? But you have to go all the way down to see all the data. If you have a million points, you have to see a million points before you actually provide a guess of your solution. If these data are somewhat redundant, you might guess that if you actually use them at some point, you might actually get good steps in the right direction. But now you know you're waiting. Okay? If your data set says, I don't know, three gazillion points, you might ask yourself if that's the one thing you want to do. So at that point, the idea is, okay, let me process one data point at a time and provide the first guess of a solution. Okay? And that's basically, I guess, what he meant. There is an obvious other reason why this might be the case. One reason is because your data might be changing over time, OK? So already this somewhat uh, encompasses the point is that there is a notion of time. There is no notion of time here. You just get something big lying on your hard disk, and you just want to process things. But, but in what you're saying, there are things change, and then there is time, OK? And that's the other key point. If your data come in time, if they're streaming, OK, if they really come you know, in an order, uh, then uh, it's pretty natural to ask uh, whether you can process them one after the other. Notice that even if they don't change over time, okay, even if they come always from the same uh, distribution, 
arrive, you want to process them, say something, and keep on going. Okay? Even more if it changes over time. But I would say the streaming scenario is this technique, okay? where the data really comes one at a time. All right, so can we give algorithms that are going to process the data one at a time? Can you think of one algorithm? I've been sloppy enough that you have plenty, you have plenty of algorithms already. Plenty already. Anything we discussed. Look, what, here's what I'm going to do. You give me one point, I'm going to run it on one point. You give me two points, I'm going to run it on two points. You give me three points, I'm going to run it on two points. And everything I've done before, I throw it away. So this sentence makes sense if you specify it a bit more. In some sense, you want to have something incremental, something that reuse the computation you've done with one point and update the solution once you get the new point. Otherwise, any algorithm is, uh, can be inherently be used here. Okay. So the goal here is to try to derive strategies that are going to be a bit smarter than this. None of these methods, at least in the simplest form, is able to update itself. If I give you n points, you run it. If I give you n plus one points, you start from scratch. Okay? Yeah, they're all good. But uh, you, um, what is, you know, basically stochastic gradient-like methods? Okay? So we're, let's, we're going to first uh, introduce uh, one simple algorithm which is the so-called recursively squared. And then we introduced, and then we discuss next time, stochastic gradient method or stochastic gradient uh, um, descent, as it's called, SGD, SGM. So it's not a descent method, so it shouldn't, you know, strictly speaking, as it's called, it's a method, but SGD is the name that is used. These are two methods that does exactly what we want. They process the data one at a time, and you can use it uh, in situation like this. Okay, so let's first look at this. What is the idea? Please have to look because. It's, uh, um, blah, blah, blah. The idea here is uh, I want to try to have uh, a way to update my solution without having to recompute everything from scratch. Okay. Again, we are gonna. This is specific to least squares. So uh, again, I use this notation, okay. and I also use the following notation. I denote the matrix x transpose x by sigma n. Okay, sigma n is the matrix. Uh, is the x transpose x matrix obtained with the n points. And this you can think of this as the covariance matrix. As before, I, I, I called that PCA. If it, I never recentered the data. Okay, it's the second moment matrix rather than exactly the covariance. I'm going to be Okay, so th this is just one piece of notation, and we want to derive the following algorithm. So the algorithm looks like this. W n equal W n minus one minus So what's going on here? This is, this is half of the algorithm, okay? But let's see what's going on, okay? What's going on here is that I am going to uh, take, what is this? This is a piece of the gradient of what? Of the data, right? If you take, before we introduced this, this is just equal to some i w x i where when I take the gradient, I just get twice x transpose x w minus y, which is equal to sum i from 1 to n x twice x i x i w minus y i, right? So what we did, what's still written up there is the, 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 the gradient of everything, OK? So what am I doing here? I'm actually considering a little piece of this. Every time I get the point, so I get the first point, I consider the first element of this sum, and then you see I'm just going to do uh, an update. Okay? Does it make sense? 
every time I get a pair xy, I'm going to update my solution. Yes. All of them, no? Come on. <laughs> so, n. N. Okay. By the way, don't put back on this course. That I should write better. <laughs> I, I do make an effort. I do to private classes, but this is in ten years. This is my I reach my maximum. It doesn't get any better. Than this. <laughs> I don't read that comment anymore. So um, okay. So this is what's going on. Okay, and here taking one step every point I take, and when I finish my data, I stop and I don't do anything anymore, OK? Uh, OK, I got I to gotta tell you what is this, OK? And we're going to discuss two choices. The first one is recursively squares, which is written over there, and the second one is SGD, OK? Recursively squares is the one where I actually have to do computation to do this. What am I going to do? Uh, I do the following. Okay, so let me let me let me see what's going on. I write gamma. I give a recursive formulation for this. Okay, and this is a matrix. It's a D by D matrix. Okay, and it looks like this. Pick the previous guess, and then update it like this. You you apply this matrix to this rank one matrix X n X n transpose, and then you apply it again, and you divide by this quantity. Okay. Gonna start this iteration with an identity and with zero, and you keep on going. Okay. Now we're gonna see that this is actually equivalent to computing the least square solution every time you make a step. So every time you are Taking a step, you're actually just updating your least square solution. There is no approximation. Okay, you give me a point. I comp you can view this as to be equivalent to I compute the least square solution, and then you give me a new point, and I just update my least square solution exactly. I get the new least square solution. And the only difference is that in one case I have n points, in the other case I have n plus one points. Okay, and it's because of this complicated way of doing things that costs memory, because now I have to carry around this one big matrix. I don't have to carry around the data. Notice that every time you give me a data. Point, I can throw it away, but I do have to carry around the previous estimates for gamma, big gamma, and omega. Okay? Make sense? So this is the recursively squares algorithm. Let me show you how to how to get this. Okay, or at least a sketch. Or maybe not. Okay. The, is the expression clear? Is my uh, notation clear? Okay. Again, I have, I have an iteration that depends on one point at a time, okay? And is this just a distinct point in my training set coming one at a time? And, uh, and then I have this step size, which is a matrix that I update through this recursion, which is simple because you see all I have to do is to, these are just matrix operations, okay? What, what is this? My claim is this is just a way to compute the exact solution of least squares, so let's see it. So, if you if you consider the solution of these squares, so you know you have this problem. Then you consider the least square solution, which is just the other equation. And this is what we call 
simple gamma n, right? So this is the solution. This is going to be important. This is going to be the solution for n points. I'm going to add the n because we want to check what happens when we add one point. So we're going to keep track on how many points we have, OK? Thanks. So this is just least squares, regular least squares for n points. So good. If you take the n kind of facial expression, we go a bit faster. Which means that Wn is equal to in within this notation. I call this stuff sigma. So this is going to be sigma n to the minus one. Okay. Now. We're going to, for the sake of the presentation, we are going to assume that this matrix is invertible. Okay? When it's not, we're going to just add a plus lambda. So we're going to do the same reasoning with, for a regular. But for now, just, it, this doesn't change the, what, you know, this story. And we just, we're going to assume that this is invertible. And then I do the reasoning for all n big enough so that any of these matrices for any n is invertible. Okay? So I start from an n big enough that any of these matrix is invertible. And I do this just for the sake of the presentation. If this is not the case, we're going to use the price version. So we're going to replace this with this. And you'll see exactly what is the implication of this. Basically, rather than solving exactly squares, we'll be solving exactly ridge regression. So I do ridge regression, and then when you give me a new point, I just have OK? So this story will hold for least squares if they're invertible, or ridge regression if they're not. So it's not going to be about an early stopping story for now. OK, so what do you do? Let's massage this a little bit. Is, is it clear? We want to just uh, you know, now massage this a couple of times. So this matrix here is just the sum of the xi weighted with respect to the yi, OK? So I can, this is just, I ju I'm just rewriting the second term this way, x, i, y, i. That's what, OK, yes? There are too many sigmas here. For any n, so let's say it's for, it's, it's for a specific n. So I want to do this for n, and then for n minus 1, and then take the difference of the two. OK, so you're imagining like you n points. Point. Yeah, there are n but points. And inverse, so. There are n points in here, and I'm using them all. It is, it is, it is. I mean, it's for any n, OK? It's a, think about it the way you want. I have n points. I assume that I can do least squares, and I do it. And I'm just going to massage it a little bit. So the first step is this, OK? And then you agree that what I can do is that I can just take one point out, OK? The last one. I did nothing, agree? I just did nothing. I just took one last element. OK, now what I want to do, I want to subtract from this the previous iterate. OK, so I want to do this. I want to say, OK, let's do Wn minus, not the previous iterate, the, the solution with n to the minus 1 point, OK? Which is what? Let's write it together. Now you tell me. What is Wn minus 1? Sigma inverse n minus 1 minus 1 times this okay exactly this so sum j from 1 to n minus one, x i y i Just to, can you see if I do one last round here, or it's already inv invisible? So what, what I want to do is just look. I just want to take these two terms and put them together. Okay, they, you see there. They have, I have two matrices multiplying the same term. I want to put together. So I want to write down that W n. Let me write it here. W n minus W n minus one is equal to n to the minus 1 applied just to this one vector minus, no, plus sigma n minus 1 minus sigma n minus 
1 to the minus 1 or apply to j0 and minus 1 of j like this. Correct? I just re reshuffle the, the terms and I put together the ones that are multiplying, they are applied to the same vector. Now we want to. This is just. Uh, this is the, the difference of two inverse matrices, OK? Is that OK? This is the difference of two inverse matrices. And I want to somewhat unroll it into the difference of the two matrices. So what do I mean? I basically want to do the following. I want to say, hey, this is, let me write it like this. I can do this, right? Because this is, I mean, how do you call it in English? Common. Uh, That one, <laughs> we do it for matrices, and it works just the same. You just have to take order, take care of order. Okay, so if this were number, what do you expect? You're going to have B minus A divided by AB. Okay, so here divided, you have to take care of how you do it because these are matrices. So that's why I'm doing it here. So the way you, we, we are going to derive it. Okay, because the, if you've never seen it, it's good to derive it first. So you're going to get A minus one B minus identity multiplied b to the minus 1. So you see the b minus 1 is going to be on this side. And then what do we do? We write this identity as a minus 1a, so that we get a minus 1, b minus a, b to the minus 1. OK? First good? OK, so now if you take this, what do you get? These are two particular matrices, because how do they look like? Well, this matrix here is just uh, sum i from 1 to n of xi, xi transpose. So when I take the difference of these two matrices with one extra point, I just get uh, out of one point. You agree? So let me plug this in. I just have to remember that uh, that guy is uh, that way. Order. Let's see? I get the swap order inside, so I get sigma n minus 1 minus sigma n. So I have sigma n minus 1 minus 1. Sigma n minus 1. OK. Yes? Okay, and um, why also there is not a minus one here? And, uh, they're converging. So what is this? This is just uh, minus x n x n transpose, the last one. Okay. So let's see. And what is this? X signifies everything. Let me put the, there is a plus here and a minus here. I just put the, I just put the minus in front of everything. Okay. Okay. I think we're done basically. So let's see what we have to do. We stare at this and we realize that this is just. A, what is this? We gave a symbol to this. It's just the inverse matrix with n minus one point applied to this blah blah for n minus one point. So it's just the least square solution with n minus one points. So it's what we call. Wn minus 1. Okay? So let's write this. Now we have sigma n minus 1. Xn by n minus sigma n minus 1. Xn, Xn transpose. Wn minus 1. But this is just, uh, you know, in the notation I use above, is just Xn. One inner product, okay? Just the, you know, I just that I use transpose to be the outer product. I think we're done because now we get uh, gamma n minus one x n y n minus x n w n minus one. I make them small now, but.
Perfect. And we are uh, almost done, right? If Look, you now I just take this W and I put it on the other side. Okay. So this whole thing implies that the N is going to be equal to W N minus one uh, plus this. And I guess there was a sign difference because I might have uh, swapped the order of these two things inside. Enough. So it's actually very simple. You just write uh, the solution of least square for n for n minus one. You take the difference. You just do some linear algebra, and you get your your thing. We are almost done. We are not quite done, okay? Because for now, you see here, I get this inverse, and you see why I have to assume that things are invertible. A another problem is that if you were just to do this, uh, you would defeat the purpose. Because you would have to do this huge operation, this matrix inversion all the time, and then. This is no gain with respect to just uh, solving the problem every time because the, that's the main cost. Okay, so this is almost okay. The difference with there is that for now I put here the the, the covariance matrix. Okay, and this is actually amount to do you know uh, Newton method like second order optimization. This is essentially the Hessian of my objective. So it would be actually pretty fast. I use exactly n steps to converge, but uh, it's not good enough. Is this clear? Unless uh, little time, so let me uh, we finish next time. But it's almost done. Uh, to do this, we are just going to use the the Sherman-Woodbury equation. Okay, so Sherman-Woodbury is something that basically says uh, if you have some matrix that can be, if you have a matrix, we are going to use the fact that you know C is written. The product of uh, as a sum of pieces, okay, and then there is a compact expression that tells you how to expand this. But well, compact, I'm not sure, and I'm not going to write it because I have to write it again next time. But the basic idea is that uh, you do that, okay. You have a way to express the inverse as the inverse of a minus one and other stuff, and then doing that, you'll be able to express this inverse. The inverse of n and minus one, and that's what you use to derive uh, this recursion. Okay, so what we want to do next time is to finish this, which is one line, is like that. You just, I'm gonna give, and then you just plug in the results, and we're done. And then comment briefly on what happens if you replace this matrix with a number. Okay, which is basically what you do when you do stochastic gradient method. That's all.